G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max and I'm joined by Flynn and we've got some cool topics today. We're going to cover APTs and Microsoft as well as some stuff around how cybersecurity people want lawyers out of the room during an incident, which is a bit of an interesting one. We'll get into that a bit later. But first of all, we'll start out with Microsoft and their APT issue. This isn't really like a massive topic, but it was just something I wanted to bring up. The other week, Microsoft had a, or someone at Microsoft, I think it was the CEO, had a talk with some news outlet on APTs. And for those who, who of you who don't know, an APT is an advanced persistent threat. Um, it's very persistent, it's very advanced, and it's very much a threat. What that means is that, <laughs> yeah, these are mostly nation state actors. So coming from North Korea or Russia or China, or the United States. They're Basically, very... yeah, every nation has them. Yeah, yeah. And Obviously, some nations are worse than others. But yeah. Um, yeah. And usually they they have massive budgets, they have massive funding, and they have very little moral or ethical like restrictions or restraints. They will come after you, and they will get you, pretty much. Like The reason they're called persistent threats is because they will stick around forever, and they will eventually find a way to compromise your systems. But it was interesting. So what brings us back to Microsoft is... The CEO, I think it was, he said, defending against APTs is very difficult. I think it's interesting because Microsoft is in a unique position where they're one of probably one of the few companies that actually can de- defend against APTs. Normally, for any regular sort of medium, small, large business, an APT is going to win pretty much 100% of the time. But it's, you know, it's interesting that Microsoft, who is this massive giant, they, you know, they acknowledge a little bit that it is, you know, difficult to for them even to defend against them. I can imagine they probably had some close calls, but, um, you know, it's it's impressive really that they haven't had a an enormous data breach considering how big of a target they are. Really, yeah. Well, I was going to say is that even though they do, you know, have probably one of the biggest resources for security in the world, they've also got one of the biggest attack services in the world. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh. I'll touch a bit on what you said that it's surprising that they haven't had a big breach. The thing with the APTs as well is that you probably don't even know that yeah, they're in your systems true. a lot of the time. They're not going to be hitting you with ransomware unless certain countries like North Korea, yeah, because the actual uh, GDPR is fueled off of not GDPR. What's the word? GDP. G- their GDP is actually fueled off of cybercrime. It's like something like eighteen or twenty percent of their. Oh, it's significant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's significant. But the majority of the time, they're more just going to be like sitting there, waiting, spying, uh, collecting data on you know, particular people or particular things that they can potentially use in the future. Yeah, it's like national interests. Yeah. Um, I do kind of feel for Microsoft in a way that it, it's so difficult for them to um, defend everything that they have. It's basically impossible, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you said, advanced persistent threats, they're persistent. They're probably going to get into a system if they want to, especially if you're looking at, you know, your Chinas and your Americas. It's pretty much um, game over, I would say, a lot of the time as soon as they start um, really, really trying to get into somewhere. Yeah. Once you're on their radar, it's, yeah, it's pretty much done. Yeah. But, yeah, I thought it was just an interesting sort of thing to bring up. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah the big dogs are saying that it's near impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. So, what hope do the rest of us have <laughs> yeah uh, that being said obviously we're not trying to say that like oh there's no point in trying to invest in security because the majority of the time security i'd say is low-hanging fruit that gets yeah. exploited yeah um even though that these advanced persistent threats sometimes you can't really do much about it that doesn't mean that you can do as best as you can to try and defend against it yeah don't well, uh you should you should be yeah, yeah. yeah. at the end of the day you want to, it, it's more satisfying. It's a little bit difficult, right? Yeah. <laughs> that they try exactly. to get in your system. But, um, yeah, the point is, is that, you know, a lot of people aren't even aware of what APTs are. I assume everybody who listens to this podcast is. Yeah. But, um, even Max was telling me the other day, somebody, he was talking to somebody sort of around the security sphere that had no idea what APTs were. Oh, um, yeah. Or what they're really capable of. Yeah. And, um, and it can come as quite a shock to some people when you think, oh, Okay, there are these you know mysterious groups that, with the you know with, with their discretion, can come after you and they will win. Yeah, they don't really have the law um sort of holding them back as well. No, because you know the government is 
um, what are you going to do? Arrest them? It's yeah. Just... Well, they're they're funded by their own governments. Yeah. Their own government's not going to throw them under the bus. Yeah. Most of the times. So uh, something else we wanted to talk about as well is um, I've no- I've known this to be a problem a uh, fair bit, and I've spoke to a couple people in the industry about this. But I saw an article where the ASD was talking about a big problem with uh, lawyers in cybersecurity. Mm. Basically, a lot of the time where people see is they get uh, the lawyers in the war room or anything like that when a cyber incident happens and we know how important communication is for a cybersecurity incident uh, and they're basically just saying like, no, stop talking. They are, um, yeah, basically stop talking. We're not saying anything because they're more concerned about what's going to happen in the future rather than fixing the solution right now and being transparent about what's happening, which uh, as you can see with, you know, situations like Medibank, Optus, HWL, Ebsworth, we saw as well, where they kind of say, oh, shush, shush, we're not going to say anything, and it doesn't turn out. No. Um, it always turns out much better. Um, one thing I saw was really interesting in this um, article. Uh, the ASD has been pushing the parliament to furnish the directorate with so-called safe harbor legal protections. Mm. What that says to me is they're basically trying to say, uh, during a cyber incident, they're not going to be liable for saying a certain thing. Uh, that something's happened so that there's more incentive to actually come out and say when an incident has occurred and be transparent about it. Yeah. What that actually means, I don't know, because obviously you're not going to say, oh, yeah, you can't be liable for a legal act no. because then nobody would be able to be charged. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a problem in Australia anyway, is that a lot of the time the government is just a little bit of a smack on the wrist when there is a cyber incident. Yeah, and especially if it's like a really obvious or really like, you know, basic a security issue that shouldn't be there in the first place like companies that have cases where it's not a you know a domino effect of things going wrong and wrong and wrong and you know it's a massive issue that no it's not what we're talking about it's when there's you know an optus for example where they just left an api open so clearly they're like their cloud systems were not you know blocking or having any guardrails in place to stop just like developers from just you know pushing an API to the public, that kind of behavior should be punished in some monetary sense. It kind of falls on Optus to have those guardrails in the first place. Whereas if there's some, say if you're getting attacked by an APT, right, that's less of a of a you can't fully put the blame on the company as much when there's a incident like that. Yeah, there's probably you know, areas where they should have had measures in place and they probably will be held account- accountable. But it makes sense that there's some kind of legal, like would you say, like a grace period or something. Yeah, so apparently this is actually something that um, the NSA in the US does where they have a, they call it a limited use model. Yeah. Basically, which prevents information provided by companies battling cyber crimes from being used in legal damages claims or by regulators. Mm. So basically, when the, what they come out to say in the initial part of the incident, yeah. they give them safe harbor so that this can't be used in legal damages, which right. actually sounds pretty good because there's such like a discretionary thing. And as we said, that people always shush, shush and never say anything. Um, and... It's actually caused many issues in the past. Um, This was supposedly meant to be addressed by the government, the Albanese government in the cybersecurity strategy that came out. Yeah. Um, I actually don't recall seeing anything on that. Um, So, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But no, it's it's interesting. There should be, you know, the the management staff and the people working on the, the boots on ground when there's an incident going on you would expect them to have full support by the government and yeah. you know be able to try and resolve things and be transparent and you know work a little bit to to fix things that are wrong they should have a little bit of a you know safe kind of um environment to be able to do that where actions that they take which are critical in an incident you know shouldn't necessarily be held against them especially if it's you know talking to the public right you know, it's silly to just yeah, be able to hold them liable for something like that when they're at a time of crisis. It, cyber incidents can be the same as like if you know your building was burning down in some sense. Like yeah, there, there's plans and risk, uh, you know, playbooks and everything going on that you know it. If you're in a sinking ship and you you know yelled to your captain, you know, shit, 
we have to fix this. You wouldn't expect the, the person yelling that to the that to the captain to be. Yeah, I'm you know, taking you to court. I'm taking you them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Talking communication is so key in a cyber, risk, especially when people are like, oh, I don't know, have I been affected? Yeah. Um, and when they figure out about that initial breach, that's always the first thing customers are like, have I been affected? Yeah. And then if the it's like closed gates, they just don't talk about it from that point until something's figured out six months down the line. Yeah, it's stupid. Um. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, it's pretty bad. Yeah, so this is something that has been addressed. So, like, um, I have, as I said, seen a lot of people coming out with like cyber solicitors, and basically, it's a specialty of solicitor that has knowledge of cybersecurity and you know how to support a crisis team. Yeah. If something does go down, and not instead hamper them. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.